am so excited to talk to you because like I just told you, I've spent like my whole day in like Jin Ponton land and I've been watching your content and watching your reels and I watched your fucking TED talk because you did <laughs> a TED talk. Like, let's start there. Like, how do you get a TED talk? You're lucky enough to know fabulous, amazing people. Like I was asked by the producer of that event, who is a dear friend of mine. And she is an awareness warrior. Like she is constantly in the social justice realm, pushing for trans rights and black rights and equity across all platforms. And maybe in 2016 or 17 was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune condition called MG. I think it's misothenia gravis, but I know it goes by MG. And now she works basically in disability rights and in accessible spaces and in awareness for, you know, like Spoonie awareness. And so she and Spoonie awareness, do I know what that is? Oh, Spoonies. So like previous to COVID, the way that the community of autoimmune disordered people would talk about their conditions was by using the spoons analogy. So it would be like, if you have arthritis or asthma or, you know, some kind of major autoimmune condition, lupus, you start the day with X number of spoons, let's just say like 10 spoons. And you have 10 spoons worth of what you can do for the day. And so maybe that involves like getting on a bus. And maybe the next spoon is like sitting in a meeting. And the next spoon is like going out and buying a new pair of pants because you need that. And another spoon is like having a meal with a friend. And so spoonies are aware of how many spoons they have because just by virtue of living life with that level of disability and inaccessibility, there's just less bandwidth in what they can invite into their world and what they can accomplish or do without taking on damage in a day. So I think that we have developed a greater awareness of people with autoimmune issues and with disability access and taking care of our most compromised yeah. people because COVID was very revealing in that aspect. But, you know, it's a major condition and it's brought her a ton of challenges and difficulties and learning curves. And so she produced this TED event and pretty much invited, it was in the middle of COVID. So we weren't like doing auditions or anything. So she reached out to a bunch of like just incredible people that she knew. There's a trans woman who's constantly at the helm of trans rights and she did a speech. There were doctors at the brink of a bunch of really important research, which is the lamest thing I could possibly <laughs> say about it because I can't remember remember at this moment, but like um, mostly amazing women. Was it all women? I believe it was all women, amazing women doing amazing things. And I was very fortunate to be invited into that group. And so I was like, yes, I will do this terrifying thing. Did she come to you and say, do you want to do a TED talk? And what would you want to do it about? Or was she was like, I want you to talk about this? Or like, how does that go? No, she asked me, even though I'm sure that she could have intuited that I would have it be about body politics. And she was like, what do you think you want to do? And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure it's the same drum I've been banging for a long time. But like, here, let me do it in a more footnoted and legitimate academic way, you know? Yeah. And it was all about fat phobia in Hollywood. It's going to be linked in the show notes to the podcast. But like, I watched it and I was like, everything you said was like, well, it was so well researched, but also presented in a way where I was like this, you're speaking from just like, true life experience. That to me is so powerful. Can you talk a little bit about like how that has kind of preceded your career up until this point? I would say, thankfully, most of the major frustrations that I had with the business being fat phobic happened prior to when I jumped into film and TV. And it's kind of why I made the pivot. Because like 
most of us, I started in theater. And like, if you are a fat girl in theater, you are not playing roles that are age appropriate for you. So yeah, you're the, of- you're the queen or the mom at like age 15. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Like I did a production of Richard the Third, and I played Queen Margaret and I was unhinged and bonkers. And it was so fun. But like, when I was done with college, and I started auditioning in New York, for theater, I was getting the feedback of like, this resume doesn't make any sense. Like you have a baby face, you are 22 years old, what do you want us to do with you? Mm-hmm. The only place that you actually belong is the ingenue role. And we know you're not going to read for that. And I'm like, okay, so did people really say that to you? Oh, no, no. But of course, that was like the subtext, right? That was what they said. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that was the underlying dog whistle, which was just always like, you'll have a career in your 40s and 50s. And I was like, what am I supposed to do for the next 20 years? So I found a good niche in children's theater, which is like how I worked, how I kept the lights on, but you know, I didn't want to do it. And then kind of just naturally, it seemed like film and TV was opening up and they were more interested in the way I looked for their projects than theater ever was ever, ever, ever. And I was like, Oh, well, if I can be like, an age appropriate nuanced character here and make more money. Okay, bye theater. Sorry, you missed out. (laughs) And so I made this pivot when I was like 25 and didn't look back like I've done a little bit of theater here and there, but it remains perplexingly and maddeningly so ivory tower protected, you know, like literally, I think there's been a lot of justice work towards that on Broadway and in theater for people of color. Mm -hmm. But like it maintains a very stubborn status of like white, cis, het, thin Broadway stars telling the same old stories by the same old, also white, cis, het people. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, well, when is it going to go back to the people again? When is theater going to be? What do you think it is that makes someone in a larger body have to apparently like play older? Do you have any thought on that? Because it feels so silly, like because you quote unquote, take up more space, you have to be like, wise and older. Is that something you've dealt with? That sounds so silly. Absolutely. And I think that's where it makes an immediate pivot to the racist underlying lore of fat phobia, which is that fat phobia was essentially birthed in Africa as European colonies were moving into the area to differentiate the purity of white people from the perceived savagery of the Africans. And it couldn't just, quote unquote, be based upon color, because now all of a sudden there was interracial babies being born. So you couldn't say instinctively that like, all white people, very good, all dark people, very bad. So they started to go based on body size. And they started to delineate between these thinner, more deprived bodies, because that's what was happening in white Protestant Christianity at the time. Like it was this very strict set of enjoy absolutely nothing about your life, deprive yourself every joy, including any more food than is absolutely necessary, including drink, including sex, including like all of the pleasures of life. And that has never been any other indigenous person's approach to life on earth. Like it's just so inhuman and it was inhuman for Africans. So their bodies were bigger, they were rounder. And when our our forefathers decided, made this terrible pivot, the kinds of tropes that you would see about Black women in particular were that they were heavier, they were rounder, more sexualized, or they became the caregiver. So that's where you get like the mammy trope. That's where you get the expectation that the Black housekeeper or Black nanny or black maid would be like the Aunt Jemima trope would be this large black woman who delivered love and care and nourishment 
to white people. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's that exact train of thought that's like, oh, well, this mother is very nurturing and maternal and warm. So because what we see as that was never like the waspy white woman, the person who was raising these children with love was the black woman who was hired or indentured in their service. And so we make that pivot by saying, if she has to be maternal, she has to be like a black woman. And so let's make her a fat actress. And if she can't be black by virtue of the casting and the family structure, well then fine, find a fat white actress because she'll remind us of the fat black mammy stereotype. Like it's so racist. It's fucking wild. Like I read about this, the book is called Fear the Black Body, I believe. Yes, exactly. And it's just like, I mean, wild and also crazy that in this world where we feel like we're so above all of this stuff, it's literally so ingrained in us that we have no idea where our thoughts even come from. So do you feel like as you made the pivot to film and television, do you feel like since you made that turn, have things changed? Have your opportunities changed? How has it looked for you in booking on film and TV? It's been a totally different experience entirely. One of the other like insidious ways that it shows up in theater is in vocal type. Hairspray is actually one of the only roles that it's not the case because Tracy's voice is so like nasal. So if you don't have a good like Bonnie Milligan belt, Bonnie Milligan's amazing. But if you don't have a belt and you have like an ingenue soprano voice, it quote unquote does not fit your body because you expect a blacker sound to come from a fat woman, right? So like theater never, ever got better. And film and TV started to open up in really interesting ways. And I will, of course, say like there were awful things being written where it's like, <laughs> it was literally a breakdown for a film that I ultimately really liked. And I screen tested for it. This was at the very beginning. I was like 24, I think. And I was reading for the 16-year-old girl and the breakdown from a very legit casting director and a very legit filmmaker mm -hmm. called this girl a shameless chow hound. Oh, oh my God. And this girl was like a 16 year old butterball. 16? Mm hmm. And like, I mean, I definitely could play 16 at 24, but that was the description of the character. And so I was super aware that if I got this role, it would be a pretty fat phobic situation. And like, it was part of the plot and I could tell that it was well intended, you know, but like, written by <laughs> she <people>. says trepidatiously. <laughs> you know, tough because it was a different time. And it was written by thin people who were like, let's tell an interesting story about fat people. Like I'm sure the playwright of the whale meant to do something that he thought was inclusive. And then it, of course, turns out to just be more of the same. Other than a few turns like that, for the most part, I have found a lot of happiness in film and TV. And with most of the roles that I've done, not having anything to do with my size at all. Like it was just a breakdown. It was just a breakdown for usually a fairly like, lighthearted, gullible, sweet person. And it could have been a person of any size to show up and do it, but they liked me. And it was not looking for a fat actress. Some of them have been, but I've always been very communicative with my reps pretty much since that first moment when I was brand new. I was like, hey, it's pretty important for me in the world to show up as the thing that I think people who look like me need to see. And so I really, really don't want to be submitted for self-loathing roles. I'll walk a line on how the external world perceives me, but I never, ever want my hat tossed in the ring for like someone who is really 
just at the end of their rope and painted in a light that's like pathetic and desperate and animalistic and like really the way that they do fat actors dirty at most turns. Yeah. Well, and having the wherewithal too to say that to your reps when you first get started, that's pretty ballsy to be like, hey, don't submit me for certain roles. Regardless of what the impetus is, that's still hard to do. That's a, there are a lot of actors struggle with that. Yeah. Everybody who I've worked with has been so supportive. So like whenever I would have like a change of guard and sign with someone new, I was like, just so you know, I will do a lot of things, but this is one thing that I don't do. And so I've only had a couple of auditions through the years where it was like guests are on a medical drama where she's just like so fat and crying all the time and I'm like oh my god I just have to pay this bill like can we just <laughs> thankfully <laughs> thankfully I haven't done any of those jobs I never ended up getting them maybe because they could perceive loathing radiating from me but <laughs> Oh my God. You know, it's interesting because I feel like this leads to what we're going to talk about in a little bit, which is like making your own work and putting your own stories out there in having nothing to do with however you look. But before we touch on that, if you were talking to actresses, there's a ton of actresses in my Patreon who were like, how does she feel like it's advanced? What could we do better? If you could tell like writers and producers and things like that, how we could do better, what would you say? I would say it's very important to approach the wholeness and totality of occupying a fat body the same way as we are really starting to be more thoughtful and nuanced in the way that we portray characters of color, queer and trans characters. Like our lives are not defined by one element of our demographic. Our challenges often are, but it's not great, point. right? It doesn't make a personality is really the number one rule. Like no one's personality is fat. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> God. <is>. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so important. And I think too, the same way that we have seen the call for like, okay, if we're going to see more black stories on screen, we need more black writers in the room. And I'm seeing some really interesting stuff about the WGA upcoming strike. That's like, did you know that they're not actually promoting any of us to story editors? And I was like, oh, I did not know that. No wonder everyone wants to strike because you're just keeping them at the lowest possible level with no benefits. That's crazy. But in that same vein, we need to also have fat writers in rooms. And like, it's a little strange how few fat writers are actually out there or certainly fat women who by and large, have an enormously different life experience and experience in the world than fat men. Like that's just unfortunately a gendered reality and becomes more and more fraught, like the more intersectional marginalizations that go on top of that. But like, yeah, you've got to have people in the C-suites. You've got to have people representing like it's kind of tough when all of Hollywood, including all of the people who make the decisions, are the ones taking Ozempic and like trying to lose 10 more pounds when it's like, okay, but if you had a fat executive, do you realize how freeing that would be for everyone? For everyone. Yeah. It's this, oh, the Ozempic thing, I could go on and on. You talked in your TED Talk specifically too about like having eating disorders growing up. And I'm very open about the fact that I've dealt with mine and deal with it on a life ongoing basis. It feels like sometimes it's almost inevitable that it's going to be a part of this career for a lot of women. It feels like there's almost no work around, no matter what sector of the business you're in. Like, how have you dealt with that in your mental health too? Because so much of this job is mental health. Totally. Something that my best friend talks about all the time is curating a visual diet because what you see is what becomes aspirational. When I was learning TikTok, I had to learn how to make TikTok a survivable experience because I'm just like looking and it's not my Instagram, which has been very well curated. And that's like so many incredible women and queer people all in fat bodies of color and like across gender non-conforming lines. And like, I see people in whom I find a lot of validation and they help me increase my capacity of empathy and normalcy when I see them. Like that improves my interaction with the world. And when I opened TikTok for the first time, I was like, oh no, everyone is so thin. Everyone has filler. Everyone is, oh God, oh God. And I had friends who were like, you have to do the same thing with TikTok. It's so important. And so like, 
there are shows that are just too thin and hot. And I'm like, if you're not being thoughtful enough with your casting and you're not telling an interesting enough story that includes more than just thin, hot people, what are we doing? I'm very choosy. And like, of course, you can apply that to ageism too. And of course, like colorism and racism. I'm super choosy with what I choose to ingest because it absolutely has an impact on me. It absolutely makes my ED go kind of fritzy. And I'm like, Oh, no, don't you start knocking on the door again. Like we got to get back to the baseline here. So for me, that is critical. And it has made such a huge difference in my world in really important ways that are marginalizations that are not my own to normalize and beautify and create empathy and compassion and like, you know, a real magnetism towards stories of people who would not otherwise be in my worldview, you know, they would absolutely be along the margins. That certainly helps my relationship with myself, but it also just makes me a kinder, more accepting person in general. I have a follow up question. That's what did you gain back? when you stopped the push to make yourself smaller? Oh, my God. Oh, that is lovely. My presence, my joy. The first time it really happened, I was 24. All of these things like the, the shameless chow hound breakdown converged in a place and space and moment for me where Previous to Instagram, I'm going to date myself here hardcore, but previous to Instagram, the only way we could find people that we didn't know on the internet was blogs. There were these things called blog rings, says grandma, and they would tie together a bunch of blogs that all had the same purpose. And so there was a blog ring called the Fatosphere. And the Fatosphere had blogs and writings and essays from so many like fat luminaries who are still in the space now who are like immensely famous now Marilyn Wan and Kate Harding and Lindy West and mm. Saucy West and like Marie Denae and like all these incredible women with very few exceptions just writing about how subversive it was to accept your body and to not just love your body in like a 2D way, but to really show your body love, to nourish your body and like put lotion on your belly or on your thighs or on your arms or like the parts of you that you have been taught to hate to actively show them love in a way that's really quite radical and not like hashtag body positivity. That was totally life changing for me. And it was in that moment, as I was trying to figure out how to be thinner in this body that would never get thinner. It was at the point where it was like, yeah, good luck with this ED. I'm not going to do shit for you. And I was like, Oh, my God. So I found these luminaries at the exact right time in my life. And it was like, permission to just be permission to allow myself to be happy permission to allow myself to not be at like a way station a spiritual way station like you're constantly waiting for this train that is never coming because there will never be the right train it will never ever be the right train you are just in your body in this moment and can you be in clothing that doesn't make you need to change shape to fit it can you be with people who don't make you feel like you are unaccepted if you are the size you are? Can you cut out like jobs and other things in your life that are incredibly invalidating of who you are and would love to heap the shame on roll after roll? Like it was like breathing. It was like just falling backwards into a meadow and like allowing myself to breathe and just be okay as I was for the first time in my entire life. Ugh, I'm like, I'm like taking deep breaths with you on this. It just feels, how did it change how you showed up in your acting career? Because so much of how we show up is who we are as much as we try and fight it sometimes, you know, releasing that part and accepting who you were. How did it change your auditions and the work you did? I started to look for the opportunities to subvert. 
and I started a blog and I joined this ring. It was specifically about my experiences as an actor coming up because there were no actors. There were just like major intellectuals and like fashion icons and stuff. And I was like, okay, well, here's what around here. We're big fans of actors starting blogs on their way up. Just saying. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Hell yes. Yeah. And I was like posting about auditions and I was posting about casting notices that would make it out on the like backstage or actors access. And I would highlight the things that felt progressive. And I would also call out the things that felt really shitty. And I was like, this is sort of like what's happening on the actor end. I would get auditions for roles. They clearly had the expectation of me that I would be like a shrinking violet and want to like hide myself and really didn't love myself. And maybe someday I'll be thin and lovable. And I would just show up like this. I think just me showing up and me refusing to give the role that energy. It's like, I was like, Hey, here's another way you could go with it. And maybe you'll love it. And so I started reading like that for roles that were like supposed to be fat or supposed to be sad or fat and sad, you know, and then I started getting a ton of auditions for things that were totally sizeless. And then I could show up and just be me and not get docked points for not being the fat girl who plays by the rules. I was just being my energy. And it was like, oh, cool. And then once I started doing that and like getting paid for it. So like the first time it happened was with 30 Rock. And then right after that, it happened with SVU. SVU was sizeless as well. And then I did an adult swim show with Pat Oswalt that was also sizeless. It was just like weirdo rednecks. And I was like, great, that's me. And then the next project that I did was size specific. And it was so brand new at the time. It was so counterculture. But it was a long time ago now. It was 12, 13 years ago. And it was this film that I starred in called Love on the Run. And what was so subversive about it was that my character loved herself. Like she doesn't say a single bad thing about her body or her life or herself. She expects good things to come to her. Does the world reflect that? No. (laughs) But at that moment, I was like, I will 1000% read for this role because this in and of itself is like a brand new thing. And it was something that I had not seen since Hairspray. Like Hairspray at that moment was the only good example because we didn't have Lizzo yet, right? And then we didn't have, and then we didn't have, and very, very importantly, the way that it has opened up with respect to Black women of size is like, really significant. And I think that's a really important precursor because it is the white perceived conflation with blackness that makes fat phobia a thing at all. And so for fat black women to be on screen in these unapologetic roles where they are no longer being cast as the mammy or as the sex pot is a really important step to white women and white passing women also getting that same freedom to just be in their bodies on camera. And we can see it happening. Like I've been getting the questions for a really long time of, is it changing? Is it changing? Is the needle moving at all? What's so crazy is that I've been doing this for so long that I can say unequivocally, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It is. It is improving every month, every year. And was there one role that you were on set for that you were like, this is a huge step forward. Was it that movie? I mean, Diet Land was also really great in what in all the things it did. Was there one that like stood out or a scene that stood out to you to be like this we wouldn't have done this 15 years ago? Oh man, at the time it was Love on the Run. Love on the Run was so subversive and important. And then the next really major thing was Diet Land. And I was like, okay, Diet Land is taking this further. So I got to be in that moment where like, congratulations this fat girl doesn't hate herself. And then finally, okay, not only is this a world where fat women are not hating themselves, but also let's call toxic masculinity what it is. Let's call white fragility what it is. Let's call transphobia and homophobia what they are. Ageism. Diet land is so radical and broke 
all of the rules and it was an absolute sham that we only got one season. I agree. I was like, was this three years ahead of its time? Like, was it, did we just peak too soon here? I know. And it's crazy because we were in production in 2017. So we started filming like right after Me Too exploded. And it was amazing because not only were we tackling everything that we tackled on that show, but also the entire production team and so many people behind the camera were women. And so it was also a female led set and production. And it was my first time in that kind of an environment. And it was crazy how little yelling there was, how little like masculine control, control through aggression was what was propelling the day that didn't exist on this set. It was like, so quiet, calm, collected. And like we were coming in ahead of schedule every time I worked. Like, I know. Unheard of. (laughs) Yeah, right. It's like, oh, you don't have to be a dick. You just want to be a dick. It's what you're used to. Yeah. It was really incredible. And then I would say the one that broke before that was I did this episode of Deadbeat. That was so otherworldly for me. Literally, it was this Hulu show. I saw this in your reel. It's really fun. It's so funny. I loved Deadbeat. I loved everything about Deadbeat. I was already a fan of the show. And then I got this role. The essence of the show is that this stoner can see ghosts. And so they come to him for their unfinished business. And so I am a ghost of this like really lascivious duchess from the Renaissance, who died while she was being painted nude. And it's so fun. And it's so body. And it is super duper crass and sexual. And I'm naked. I mean, I'm TV naked throughout. So I've got like pasties and you know, briefs on but like, I'm a naked, fat, ghost who's just talking about how she's gonna fuck everybody like yeah I was gonna say you were like a very sexual character because she's like like a but a Botticelli girl basically like you know like the really babelicious beautiful old painting like I wanted to ask you like was that the first time you feel like you've been like extremely sexual on camera was that like a trip that after doing a sex scene in love on the run yes but I would say so much more blue and like, oh my God, please put us through our paces because then when it's going to be asked of us, we're not going to have the experience because you've only ever had us be like sad little shrinking violets. And then out of nowhere, it's like, okay, now, you know, like ride this guy in an art gallery. And it's like, really? <laughs> no one decided to hold a class for this for fat actresses. No, <laughs> ridiculous. Oh my God. (laughs) Unbelievable. It's just, it was so fun to watch. And it was, it's just like, I don't know. You're really fun to watch on camera. I really enjoyed, I told you like before we started, I was like, I feel like I've spent my day with you because I've watched all of your footage and I watched so much of your stuff. And like, you're so fun to watch on camera. And in terms of just acting in general, what makes you tick on camera? Is there some like through line that you feel like is within your acting? Is there some lesson you took from an acting class that you feels like stays with you? Or are you just like collectively living life and collecting experiences? That's a really fabulous question. I think it's closer to the latter because I haven't been in a class I loved until 2020. I like had college and I loved college acting classes, but it was college. It was like undergrad. And then I tried acting classes in New York. Did you spend any days as a squirrel? Because I spent some days as a squirrel. Yes, of course. And like starting as a baby on the floor of the where all of your friends like picked up the night before college. <laughs> I know my friends were like going to school for accounting and I was like, I'm going to roll around on the floor in a dusty, cold room for a while. <laughs> yes. And somehow still get a cap and gown. <laughs> I know. I think about it all the time. <laughs> ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. I would have gotten a degree in something else if I had known how absolutely useless the degree would be, but... <laughs> I didn't have any classes that spoke to me after college. Like I got grifted so hard and I had like crazy, terrible acting teachers who were like, the second they could trigger you and get you to cry, they were like, there, that's acting. And I'm like, oh, this can't be, this 
can't be it. So I just was like, I'm not going to trust anyone. And I'm just going to like do my own thing. And I'm going to audition and I'm going to take feedback and I'm going to do workshops. So I was like getting the workout in workshops, but it wasn't the same as like having an artistic home. So it's definitely not something that I got from class. But I think just the delight of being present, the dangerous, exciting rawness of being present and being somewhere with somebody, just that simple truth is always what motivates me. And like, if I can be there, then that is the most dangerous, exciting place. Because we're looking into each other's souls and like, what the fuck is going to happen? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. You said there was a class in 2020 you started taking that's done you some favors or a coach or something specific. Is there someone you want to shout out? I want to shout out Riza and Steve of BGB Studio. I love them so much. I love them so much. I've been in class with each of them respectively since the pandemic because I thought forever that they were going to open an East Coast studio. And I think they might have had grand plans too at some time, but I've been East Coast my whole life. And so I was like, oh no, I have to miss out on the like one holistic place that I would trust. And then when they opened their doors virtually in 2020, I was like, well, I'm going to class. And it's just been like the most beautiful place to like nurture and nourish my artist self and to find a good community and to push myself as a writer too, because I often bring my own pages into class. And like, it's just been a beautiful place to like show up and be a human. I don't know what I would have done without it because I was there in summer 2020 and I have not stopped and I absolutely will not stop until they quit doing Zoom and I really hope they don't. I don't think they will at this point. I feel like it's too effective and it's too much of what we do. It's so much easier to stay in class like this. And when the pandemic first started and my class pivoted to Zoom, I was like, there's no way this is gonna work. There's no way we can do acting on Zoom. And now it's hard to remember that we didn't used to know how to do this. Right? Yeah. It's so funny to think about. It feels really yeah. good for me. Yeah, it's so connecting too. You can literally do a scene with someone in Australia if you needed to. It's more where the world is going. Well, you said they nurtured your creativity. So I wanna pivot and talk about Caretaker Films. I just watched an entire movie you made for TikTok. And the second you posted that you were doing that, I was like, I have so many questions. Please come on my podcast. So we're finally getting to that segment of it. But like, talk to me about this process and what the choice was to create a short film for TikTok. Oh my God. So I moved in September and I ended up close to my director, Jody, my dear, dear, dear friend who I love to make stuff with all the time anyway. But like, we've made stuff that you have to crowdfund for and then get a crew and then shoot it, right? Like the norm. And when I moved here, she was like, I can't believe you're going to be so close. We got to just make stuff. And I'm like, we do have to just make stuff. Let's not have it be the sort of Damocles of like all of the things that have to come into alignment in order for an artistic thing to happen that feels so unnecessary. And as I was reconnecting with her, I'm just held captive, captive, not captivated, captive by all these people on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube shorts who are just like, it's just their phones and a ring light. And all of a sudden, there's an audience, there's desire, nobody needs all the things that actors have been told for the last 10 fucking years are essential in order for our stuff to be seen, which was write a web series, make sure you hire a real crew, you'll have to crowdfund to so shake down all your friends and family, then submit it to festivals and try and get it purchased by a network, but be careful because they won't want to cast you in it, so be ready to let it go. And it's like, wow. That rerouted all of us for so long while we scrambled to write our web series and then get them produced and then cut them and then not put them on the internet because then you can't put them in a festival. And so like, for what, for why? And now all of a sudden, Joe Schmo here 
puts a banana on the floor for, you know, his dad to slip on and then put like fart sounds and it has millions of views and CAA is like knocking on Joe's door. And it's like, okay, clearly we missed a chapter somewhere in here where actors got permission to do more than that and to do less than all the headache. And like, I know that there are a lot of mostly comedians, but you know, actors who like play all the roles themselves. And it's just like, you know, POV shoots. And that's great too. But also there could be more. So I got super fired up about it because I was like, there is absolutely no reason we ever need to go back to that without a network or studio paying for it. And why are we not the ones populating this space that is what people are turning to for entertainment and yet it is devoid of entertainers. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Because we've been told that it's like, well, if you do that, then you're not a real actor. And like, I could go on all day about Uh this. It's trash. It's trash. And I was like, no longer are we going to be missing out on this micro video platform because I think there's a there there and you get to direct and I get to act and we get to just be out there in the ether. And we also get to make this platform a little more meaningful because how many of the same dance can I watch? How many of this transition can I watch without my brain just atrophying? Like, I go on there for the moments of gold that are really creative. And so Jody and I were like, okay, we're going to do like a TikTok movie. And I was like, hell yeah, we are. And so like the parameters were like, everything does have to look interesting. We need to be really creative with our angles and our shots so that it doesn't feel like a typical movie. Like it feels more creative visually. And then everything also has to settle very nicely into like 30 second bite-sized chunks, 30, 30 seconds to a minute. And that happened naturally. That wasn't so much on purpose. I was down in Cape May, which is a shore town in Jersey. And it's like, it's very beautiful. It's sort of like Long Beach in that it's a bunch of old Victorian haunted houses. It's haunted as hell. I mean, the house you shot at was like, where did she find this? This house is incredible. It was amazing. It was an Airbnb. No. <laughs> it was an Airbnb. It was gorgeous. It was insane. And then the exterior was a totally different exterior. And I was obsessed with it because I was down in Cape May and I passed this house and the front windows were boarded up. Not like it was abandoned, but like what people would have done at the turn of the century to like batten down the hatches. And I was like, oh, that's a weird thing to do in 2023. I want to know what that's about. And then I was like, Brody, I have the idea. And we together like over Zoom wrote this 20 minute long film about a haunted house that is boarded up for the winter. And my character Roz is hired to go be the caretaker for this house with a couple of really interesting asterisks at the bottom of the job application. The location led it, but also it was this desire to like, no, we have to tell a simple enough story, which means one person with a camera and like lots of natural light and a good location and an actor. And that's it. And then we don't need an entire film shoot and the nature of it being on TikTok and like wanting it to be more of an experiential thing. Roz is an influencer herself. So the film is not quite half, but 75% regular film footage, which is, you know, without Roz's knowledge from the camera, and then 25% her own TikToks. So we also made a TikTok account for Roz, where she's like posting how things are going and she's doing her dumb dances and she's doing the cuff it and like the whole nine. A lot of people have now found Caretaker Film, which is the cinematic experience, but the number of people who then find Roz's content herself are fewer. And that's a really exciting little, like when they get there, they're like, holy shit, the breadcrumbs. Oh, you left internet breadcrumbs. That's very exciting. Oh, uh, the internet loves breadcrumbs. I love little Easter egg stuff. That is, so 
Did you shoot the movie in the aspect ratio of the nine by 16 or 16 by nine, whatever is that called? Yeah. The- he just used Jody's iPhone and held it like this. And I remember the first shot of the day, she just out of habit went like that. And I was like, Jody, that's not how this movie goes. This movie goes like it's a story. So camera vertical always. And we would do a vertical camera check every time because it was so alien. But yeah, we shot everything just like that, just like you would for a story or a reel. And so if we end up going to festivals, which we would like to do, it will also be that with the gigantic black bars on the side because there is no wider version. Yeah. Would, can you still take it to festivals? Like, so, okay, so sometimes we get a little caught up in the process of as actors, we're like, okay, well, what is this going to be for? Is it for my reel? Is it for a fest? Like, what good is it going to do me? And a part of me is like, you're going to feel like an actor and it's going to be really great. But also beyond this, right? Like, what, what do we do with it? I think in the same way that SAG has really woefully dropped the ball when it came to the internet at all, and we're still like suffering from that. But I think because the internet is the Wild West, if you don't put it up on like YouTube and Vimeo, the fact that it exists in pieces on TikTok, I don't think would be an issue. I mean, we'll see. And a lot of festivals I've learned also have pardoned the old rule of like, it can't live on the internet because what the hell are you doing to your artists? Like, come on. I know there's too many platforms for us to be like exclusively to the Burbank film festival. Like, come on. Yeah. Right. I mean, get over yourself. So I think even things like Sundance don't require a world premiere status. Like you can just exist on the internet, but for the ones that do want unique rights, I think the fact that it's on TikTok still is like enough of a loophole. But you know, people trying to make rules about what the internet is, they're just they're like chasing a dragonfly. Like, please don't try and control it. You didn't try soon enough. And now it's what it is now. (laughs) Epic, epic. It's the ocean of the world. (laughs) We're just trying to swim to it. So do you want to do more of this type of content? Like, where does this take you from here? Do you feel like it gave you a springboard to do more work, like permission? And can I ask you how much it costs you to film your own entire TikTok movie? So the goal was that would cost absolutely nothing because all we need is for someone's shore house to work out. And then I got some stoppages that were absolutely maddening. And I went to my artist way group and in our Zoom meeting, I was ranting about it. And I was like, I can't believe this fell through. The whole point is for it to be free. (laughs) One of my group mates DM'd me and was like, hey, listen, I want to buy you the Airbnb that you've been looking at as a backup. And I was like, oh, that's very unnecessary. And he was like, no, no, no. Me paying it forward always brings in a ton of abundance. So can I please pay for this? And I was like, okay, I'm not going to say no. I did beg the universe for like a way for this to happen. And you paying for it is in fact that thing that I asked for. So I will accept this abundance. And so we use an Airbnb. So that cost $450, which was a steal because I negotiated it down because I was like, listen, we're not going to eat we're not going to shower. We're not going to sleep in the beds. We're just going to like move in at six in the morning and move out at 9 p.m. And you'll never know that we were there. No cleaning fee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The guy who owns the house was like, amazing. Okay, sure. If you take it on a day that nobody's coming and no one will come, you know, afterwards. So it was a little bit last minute because I had to wait until like 48 hours beforehand, but it was a breeze. And so it cost $450. And then like I fed me and Jody and my partner who was helping out for the day. So like, I think all told 600 bucks and only 120 (sighs) of it was mine. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But that is so much more attainable and so much more doable on such a level for so many. Right. We're going to spend that 120 somewhere. 
<laughs> yeah, I could spend it on Amazon right now. Are you kidding me? Like it's yep. like a joke. Yes. Ah, yep. I love this. Okay, so so you have this series, like you film it. It's a it's technically a short film, but I keep thinking of that as a series because I watched it all in pieces on TikTok. I love. And so, do you send it to your reps? Do you share it with people? Like, what do you do now that it's done? So, I would love for it to ultimately go to a couple choice festivals, especially ones that love weird shit. So like South by would be great, especially because I think a part of their programming, as I recall, is like brave new worlds. And it's usually about things that are on the leading edge of like technology. So I think it would be a great match for that. I think it would be a great match for like slam dance for the same reasons. Although I'm, I have no interest in like chasing around laurels. What I do love is that I want it to stand in place for brand work because I'm also an influencer, but I hate being an influencer, Sam. I'm sure that you grapple with the same thing because there are not a lot of influencers who are actors. There are lots of influencers who are just pretty people on the internet. (laughs) And then they're like, oh my God, did you see how glowy my skin is? And I'm like, oh my God, please let me make content for you, but let me make it good. Let me tell a story. And Jody is a commercial director. Like that's her bread and butter. And I don't mostly do commercials, but I do influence. And so I love this idea of like, hey, brands, if you're small enough that you don't actually have like a commercial budget, but you clearly have something that you can kick to influencers, why don't you let us make you a cool and good commercial? so that you can have that living on social and it can be your own little like narrative thing. Something that people want to watch and not just like immediately flip through. Because as soon as I hear that vocal fry, I'm like, no, no, no. I know it's a serum. I already know it is a serum. I did not even have to guess. (laughs) Oh God, I feel so seen right now. I totally know what you mean. I'm always getting, I'm always trying to figure out How do I make this better? Yeah. How do I do this differently? It's also, I struggle to be like, let me sell you something. So I'm like very, I'm like, I have to really like something to like talk about it. And like, it's so, but like, you don't make a ton of money talking about only the three products that you use on your face. (laughs) (laughs) This is my mom. It doesn't work. And she used it because it works. (laughs) They're not wearing the same. No, I've been wearing the same moisturizer for like three years and they, they don't care. <laughs> right? So like this, yeah. this is sort of my like small business hope is that this serves as like a prototype for that. And this was also a practice module for like caretaker right now is just a short. And if people fall in love with it and they're like, where's the feature? I will absolutely write a caretaker feature. No problem, Bob. But I do have a feature at the ready that I wrote with Jody. It existed as a pilot that I wrote before that. And then in 2020, she and I reworked it into a feature and I'm absolutely in love with it. And the star of that is in fact like an influencer. And so I think what this gave us the legs to do and the practice to do is to create a narrative TikTok world. And so our next project that's like just for us is going to be creating her online world and having that just exist. And it's going to probably do the same thing that caretaker did, which is like, people are not going to know me and then they'll know my character. And like, we'll see what happens in the ether with that. And whatever comes first, like the pitch or, or the interest, like if CAA is like, Hey, Polly, do you want representation? I'm like, actually, Nice work. I'm Jen. Here's my portfolio. This is the concept for a feature and it has however many followers. I'm like, yeah, it's almost like it gives you a lot of permission to do whatever sort of internet character you want to, because it doesn't have to be you being the influencer. I'm obsessed with this. Does this really check your artist box? Yes. Oh man, doing the feature would be so beautiful. Making Polly's influencer account. And this is like, you're the first person to hear this outside of me and Jody, just like talking and planning. (laughs) 
this is an exclusive. Is very <laughs> exclusive. So when I do Polly's account, I think it's going to be several things in one. I think on one hand, it's going to be very artistically fulfilling because I get to build out her world in whatever way I want, which is amazing because most of the feature takes place in an alternate dimension. Like we set her up as an influencer and then she flies through time and she is elsewhere. And so we don't really see a lot of this. And so building this out in all of the ways that I think it can be quite intricate and fun and ridiculous is going to be good. And I think also really truly helping the world because I'm not going to make her a vapid person. Like she's going to have good things to say. So I get to like be humanitarian me in the content that I put out. Can I help make someone's day easier? Can I help lighten their load? Great. So artistry did good humaning. And then also possible business stuff. So like if brands are like, hey, I saw Caretaker, are you doing more of that? And I could be like, hey, yeah, here's this thing that we're producing with an influencer. Do you want to have the placement be on this account? And here's how that's going. So like, I think it, it's a wonderful kind of Wild West in that manner. And then hopefully whatever chess piece moves wherever first, I get to be like, hey, this is my TikTok account with this many thousand followers or this many million followers and this shit goes viral. And these people are invested in her. And guess what? I wrote her a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Ta-da. Here's a full package for you. <laughs> oh my God. I did all the work. <laughs> now I'm the check. Uh, dude, dude. <laughs> what would you tell an actor who's listening to this and who's like, oh my gosh, I want to make my own content for a social media platform? Beautiful. Do it. We are not saturating anything right now. And that is ludicrous. That is absolutely ludicrous. And, you know, not to be the fucking harbinger of doom, but like something weird is going on with streamers. Something very strange is happening with the streamers. And I think there's going to be more power in being a person online. Like I just did a show called Three Women and we almost got the exact same fate as Batgirl over at Warner Brothers. We were only saved by stars. Stars swooped in and was like, no, we want this show, so we will put it on the air. But like, we made the whole thing. And Showtime was going to be like, nope, trash can. We want to go make stuff like Yellowstone now. And it's like, oh my God. And that was like a national bestseller, Three Women was. It was a huge book. Yes, and it's a beautiful show. And it stars Shailene Woodley. And Betty Gilpin is mind blowing in it. Oh my God, just wait. It's so, oh. so good. It's so good. Oh, I'm so excited. I was just going to check out her book, actually. Oh, I have the audiobook in my Audible right now. Her oh. book is supposed to be incredible. She's a great writer. She's just amazing in every way. I love Betty Gilpin. Acting with her, there's nothing easier in life than just like listening oh. to her and being affected by her. Oh my God. She's so good. What a treat. Oh, so oh my God. Okay. I'm so glad it's coming out. Uh, me too. And so because of that, and because that is happening to all the baskets that we're putting our little eggs in, our hopes, and our dreams, and we're like, man, can I just get a Netflix show or a Hulu show or what? Okay, but like, maybe let's also be a little tempered in our hopes, which I would never say, but in this particular aspect, as I watch this major industry mode shift, it's like, okay, let's disperse a little bit more evenly. And so, yeah, like there is something to TikTok. There's something to Reels. And there's not enough of us on here. I would kill to see more narrative content from creatives on these platforms. That would be a joy. You are so necessary. Your art is so necessary, like in the world. And then also in a very like practical, literal way of like, please don't make me watch another cooking fail. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually my for you page is a mess. Like I could use some help. I think too, but it's important to say, I love what you said about like the shift in terms of streaming, because if we take it back to like 30 years ago, right? Everyone was like, well, you know, I'm too cool to do TV. I'm only doing movies. And now it's like, well, I'm too cool to do commercials. I'm only doing TV. And now it's like, everyone's doing commercials. And so can we stop being too cool to do whatever the thing is that makes us feel good, that makes us an artist that like we get some care and enjoyment and artistic 
weakness out of and just do it. Like I feel like, you know, people told me that with a podcast, they're like, you know, no one really 2016 people like people don't really listen to podcasts. And I was like, I don't really care. (laughs) And now they're huge, Uh you know? Uh Uh-huh. Right. Podcasts are over and then they're all we have for our clinging mental health. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what do you do in a car without a podcast? I don't understand. Like you just listen to music over and over again. What is the radio? <laughs> Come on. I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand it. But I think it's it's such an important lesson, right? Because we think this is going to look one way. We think that being an actor is going to look one way. And I think the stuff you've shared and the things that you've been a part of is just showing that like, you don't have to be a size double zero actress on a red carpet. You don't have to be what your agent told you was an ingenue or nothing else. You don't have to be the queen in the Victorian play. You don't have to wait until someone else picks you. And you sure as shit don't have to change who you are to fit a role that's a joyous person. And you're just, you're such a good example of that. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, Sam. Don't worry. I'll send you a copy of this podcast. You can listen to it on a bad day. <laughs> I, love I love it. Yeah. A thousand percent. Why would you not make the thing that you want to make? Especially when, especially if it's for young folks, like the things that we were told 10 years ago was don't bother making anything that doesn't have incredible production design and a real camera and like a good cast and blah, blah, blah. Nobody's being told that because we will watch the dumbest shit on earth. It's already happening. That is what's happening. And so why wouldn't you make your beautiful art without the DSLR, without the producers, without the many lights and flags and background and like, yeah. And we used to, you know, it's not like it was before where, you know, you can't release your ideas because then nobody will ever go see them. No, like everyone's IP is being remade and remade and remade and remade and people get big, big movies based on like a short film they did where we already know how it ends, but we still want to go watch the version in theaters. It's just Uh different. Yes. It is. It's very interesting to work through these seismic shifts. When I think when we probably started, it was like, oh no, Hollywood's Hollywood's Hollywood. But no, just like everything else, it is a crazy crumbling, ever shifting system and world. And like, it's just trying to catch up and make all the money it can, which is fuck capitalism, but also like... We can learn to roll with the easier pieces of it. You're so great. I could keep talking to you for forever. Where should we send people to in terms of your content? We'll obviously link the film. Where else do you want to direct people to? My personal Instagram is the place that I'm most on the internet. And if people want to like deep dive, my website is jenponton.com. Very easy to navigate for an actor website. A plus to you on that one. Thank you, Kat. Thank you so much for your time, Jen. I really appreciate it. And I'm so glad I know you. Oh my God, Sam, right back at you. Thank you so much. It's really a joy to be here with you.